Good evening. Hi, my name is Steve Rader Ginsberg, and I'm the director of the Otterino Center for the Arts and Humanities. And it's with great pleasure tonight that I welcome you to our campus and this Performing Arts Center. This event tonight came out of an experience due directly to my participation in a cohort of over 50 global leaders and all arts eaters, leaders convened by the National Arts Strategies. The director of City of Asylum was also a participant of this program, and I was extremely moved by the work of the organization and the artists who work there. The Writers in Exile is the final event of the On the Move season. How many of you out there have been to a prior event for the On the Move season during our 17, 18 year? Excellent. Well, then you all know that this year um, we have focused and highlighted stories of migration and forced migration and global fusion. Tonight is a very special evening. It's a personal sharing of two amazing writers who have been forced out of their country, and here they are able to work under the protection of our laws to ensure our freedom of expression. This event could not have happened without the help of our partners across the university, especially Drs. Bilius, Barone, Peters, Raman, and Long. This event could also not have happened without the financial support of the National Endowment for the Humanities or the partnership of the Connecticut World Affairs Council. Right now, I'd like to welcome you to our partner, Amanda Jolly, Program Director of the World Affairs Council, and she's been there since October 2015. Amanda's been involved with the Connecticut World Affairs Council since her participation in the Model UN program her so at, during her sophomore year of high school. Then she moved on to become a program and educational intern, and Amanda has received her BA in international service with a focus on US foreign policy from American University. Please welcome our co-host, Amanda Jolly, Connecticut World Affairs Council. Hello, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Amanda Jolly. I'm the program director at the World Affairs Council of Connecticut. Uh, and thank you all so much for being here this evening, especially on such a beautiful spring day. Um, so tonight, the World Affairs Council is proud to partner with the University of St. Joseph Otterino Center to present this important conversation. Freedom of the press is one of the critical issues of our time. Um, and it's an honor to be joined by these writers, artists, and activists at the forefront of a global struggle, advancing freedom of speech for all. Uh, tonight event, tonight's event is part of the World Affairs Council's ongoing mission to promote, um, to create experiences that explore critical global issues and promote a greater understanding of our world. Uh, for those who may not know, the World Affairs Council is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization established in 1924, uh, dedicated to engaging our community in global affairs. Uh, can I just ask too, how many people have been to a council program before? Oh, that's fantastic. Um, like tonight, our public programs are open forums for the community to engage with our world. Uh, and I just want to plug one upcoming event we have. Uh, there's some really great ones coming up, in particular, our Luminary Award on May 10th, where we'll be honoring the Yale Cancer Center for their extraordinary impact on global health. Uh, I hope you can join us there. Uh, and it is now my absolute pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Shamala Rahman. Dr. Shamala Rahman is an expert in patterns and effects of migration and forced migration. Uh, Dr. Rahman has strong ties to both the University of St. Joseph and the World Affairs Council. Uh, she's been a professor at the University of St. Joseph uh, for 33 years, and uh, to the World Affairs Council, she served as a board member, an honorary board member, and a community ambassador. Um, I bet many people here have uh, heard about this event through Dr. Rahman herself. Um, she is a community cornerstone an interfaith uh, bridge builder, and a passionate advocate for social justice and human rights. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Shamala Rahman. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Steve Ginsberg, director of the Arturino Center here at the university, and uh, Amanda Jolly, the program manager at the World Affairs uh, Council for organizing this evening's event 
uh, giving the audience a very rare opportunity to learn from writers in exile and from a representative from the city of asylum in Pittsburgh. I would like to frame my opening remarks by suggesting a couple of conceptual tools for us to handle, to get a handle on what has brought the writers here and why we have to think about a city of asylum to host these writers. Conceptually, unless we understand the complexity of the forces that have shackled the freedom of speech and expression, we will not be able to comprehend what has brought the writers here and why freedom of expression and thought, considered a human right in a democracy, is even being questioned. Our ways of thinking must become more open to navigating through a multiplicity of a network of links. The schematic that we, must, we might draw in our mind's eye is not a simplistic one with word art with which we can decipher something, but it is more analogous to a Celtic knot we must, where we navigate the feedback loops and connections, and it's not easy to do it at the first sight. Hence, the suggestion to get our thinking to graduate from linear thinking to systems thinking and complexity. For example, the causes from which our writers have sought refuge and therefore have been forced to migrate involuntarily rather than voluntarily lie embedded in a bed of political, social, economic, geographic, cultural, and religious aspects in their respective countries. It's a veritable quilt of transdisciplinary reasons calling for a public education on global issues. Some of these causes have been initiated by transnational conditions and influences. Others of these have been intranational influences brought about by thinking caused by the insecurity and fear of the national actors, such as activists and government leaders, taking sides in threatening the creative lives of artists, such as writers, poets, and others. In thinking about the causes that led our writers to leave their home countries forcibly, we need to have a working knowledge of all the conditions in their respective countries that led them to leave home involuntarily. Having that working knowledge of the asymmetries and the disruptions requires us to get out of the comfort of what we know, whether it is little or if it is from only one perspective. Learning to unlearn, examining the drivers of the move forces us to look at situations through other eyes, to use Vanessa Andriotti's phrase. We are hearing more and more about the life threats of writers. Will we be able to make major changes when the writers are targets of setups of the politicians and enemies? The answer is no. But will we be able to create community-based grassroots education about the conditions? The answer is yes. The swelling of grassroots initiatives, public panels such as this one today, the idea of sanctuary cities, and the embrace of the refugee communities by local groups are a slow but sure way of inserting these issues into the public discourse. When we hear the names of cities such as Damascus and Dhaka from where our writers come, our acquaintance with these cities bring up memories across the spectrum. Rich history, beautiful architecture, marvelous textiles, intellectual writings, 
the legacy of colonialism. But today, to see these cities being the site of a civil war or threats to freedom of expression breaks our heart. In the spirit of Ubuntu, an African term for our global interconnections, our collective and continuing understanding of the multiple conditions of obstacles to free speech would be a deliverable from this evening's panel. I draw hope in sharing with you the words of a writer, Dr. Kavita Nambison from Karnataka. I quote, a writer travels in her imagination. Can there be greater freedom than this? As long as the heart has fixed point of departure and arrival, no matter where one's physical presence is, the writer survives. I wish to introduce the moderator of this evening's panel, Dr. Kenneth Long, a former colleague and a dear friend who will uh, moderate the panel. Ken Long is professor of history and political science here at the University of St. Joseph. He's the author of numerous articles and two books. He was Fulbright Professor of Political Science at Johannes Kepler University in Austria, and he will soon be off for a month to work as a concurrence research awardee in post-colonial studies at Linnaeus University in Sweden. His interests and publications touch upon issues of free speech and press in multiple ways. In an article, about the semantics of terrorism published long before 9-11 and current concerns about terrorism, he argued that terrorism is a term that labels certain acts of political violence as unwarranted or even heinous. His first book, The Trouble with America, criticized America's pluralistic constitutional arrangements, noting that they cause governmental paralysis, a gridlock in which public problems fester for the want of public solutions. He argued in this book that the Constitution does a good job at blocking meaningful change, but a mediocre to a poor job at protecting civil liberties in general and speech and press rights in particular. Ken's most recent book, is contemporary anti-Muslim politics, which deals with a wide range of large-scale violent acts directed against Muslims, especially the racist immigration and citizenship exclusions in European domestic policies and the many acts of war directed against Muslims in American foreign policy. It's my pleasure to introduce Ken Long. Thank you, I am Ken Long, and uh, with me are our three very distinguished uh, guests this evening. We'll have the pleasure of chatting with about issues of speech and press, and maybe a good bit about their work as well. Um, seated, uh, not immediately next to me, but one over is Osama Alomar, and uh, he, uh, like his colleague to my immediate right, will, will introduce themselves in far greater detail than I will with a brief PowerPoint that will inform you a good bit about their experiences and their work as well. Uh, Osama was born in Damascus, Syria in 1968, and he's now living in Chicago. Osama today, and a prominent practitioner of the Arabic very short story. He's the author of Full Blown Arabian in English, and three collections of short stories, and a volume of poetry in Arabic. Alamar's first full-length collection of stories, The Teeth of the Comb, was published by New Directions last year. To my immediate right is Tuan Das. He's a poet and activist, political columnist, short story writer, and essayist. He was born and raised in Barasal, Bangladesh. He's the author of seven poetry books in his native language, Bengali. He was involved in the Little Magazine movement and edited a few literary magazines He's had contemporary poetry criticism articles, short stories, 
and political columns published in the last 15 years in Bangladesh. And seated furthest away from me is Nathan Duran. He is the production coordinator at City of Asylum. City of Asylum, as you've heard a little bit about, is the national headquarters of ICORN, International Cities of Refuge Network, which is based in Pittsburgh. It was created to protect endangered literary writers so they continue to write freely and not be silenced. He earned his bachelor's degree in political science, sociology, and legal studies from the University of Pittsburgh a couple of years ago. And also uh, then he worked as editorial intern for the City of Asylum's online magazine, Samsonia Way, before becoming a part of the City of Asylum staff. In his current role, Nathan oversees the production of City of Asylum's 150 events annually, as well as the maintenance of City of Asylum's new cultural center, Alphabet City. Welcome. Thank you very much, Ken. <laughs> Nathan, why don't we, we start with you and you can tell us a little bit about uh, City of Asylum and get us started. Of course. Uh, first off, I would like to thank everyone here at the University of St. Joseph and the Otterino Center. You've all been uh, incredibly hospitable to, to us and, and very friendly and, and uh, the classes that we visited have all been very, very spirited and and um, just a, a great time. We've we've been really blown away by what's going on in this space. Uh, we would also like to thank the World Affairs Council. Uh, this wouldn't be happening without them. They have been uh, longtime uh, collaborators and partners of uh, City of Asylum. So thank you, World Affairs Council. Uh, City of Asylum was founded 14 years ago to give sanctuary to a single writer from China, a man by the name of Huang Zhang. Uh, he was a poet who was persecuted for decades for his poetry and his writings. He was not necessarily overtly political, although he was also a political activist. He was mainly persecuted for his art, for his poetry, for his writing. But thankfully, he was able to leave China and he came to Pittsburgh as our first writer in residence in 2004. Since then, our organization has evolved and changed drastically. We, in 2004, uh, put on a single event, which was a jazz poetry collaboration between Huang Zhan and jazz saxophonist Oliver Lake. This past year, we put on 152 events in our new cultural center. The reason we're putting on all these events is because we find that just providing a home, a safe home for, for our writers uh, isn't enough. We need to create a community of writers, readers, and neighbors to support these writers. If they come to Pittsburgh and, and they're awash in this ocean of, of a foreign land, it is very difficult to, to continue to write to, uh, to press on. So we have uh, writings, reading, or sorry, we have readings, we have movie screenings, we have concerts, we have storytellers, all to create an extended community that our writers can tap into to make their transition into American life more easy for them. And beyond this, we find that exposure to new stories, new outlooks, new ways of thinking, they're critical and fundamental to building understanding, empathy, a sense of community, and a functioning society and democracy. So in these programs, we're not just providing a space for our writers to speak, but we're providing a space for all underheard voices to be heard. And if I can just say before we get started here, I hope when you all leave here this evening, that you continue, as you are doing here tonight, to seek out new stories, to seek out new perspectives, and to take them in without judgment, and to don't hesitate to share your own unique perspectives, your own unique vantage point on the human condition. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Tuhin Dash, from Bangladesh, he is going to talk a little bit about his life and then do a brief reading. Tune in. 
My name is uh, Tuhin Das, and I am from Bangladesh. I am a free thinker, blogger, writer, and human rights activist. I have seven poetry books and edited several literary magazines in my native language. I was born in 1985 in Bangladesh. In 1988, the authorities declared that Islam is the state religion. Since 90s, I have been seen that the people were slowly getting blind, blinded by religion day by day in my country. Even though my family were citizens of Bangladesh and shared equal rights with everyone, it became clear we were unwelcome because we were minority. My childhood friends always said that I should leave Bangladesh and go to India. I asked them wh why. They said, Bangladesh is not your country. India is a country for Hindus. Almost every week, my sister or I would have a bandage on our heads from having rocks thrown at us or being pushed. When I became a writer, I wrote columns protesting discriminatory religious treatment because I wanted future generations in Bangladesh to be able to experience religious tolerance. In 2013, the Shahbag movement initiated by a handful of online activists, bloggers spread from Dhaka to Borisal in my hometown. I joined the candlelight vigils and the marches and read my poetry at public gatherings. My main goal was to speak against religious persecution and for a more secular Bangladesh. At the time of the protest, the Hipajata Islam, a fundamentalist organization, started a counter protest against the Shabak protest, declaring war against all the bloggers and writers, forming a pact with, with the government. A hit list was issued of 84 writers and bloggers to be killed. Al Qaeda related local militant organization published their own hit list. The one from Borishal named three poets, including myself. Three days before my name appeared on the list, the blogger Niloy Neil was killed inside his own apartment. I was terrified. I went to the police, who suggested that I must leave the country and go to India because my family background is Hindu and, and Hin India is a Hindu majority nation. Then they asked for all of my writings and they started taking photocopies of my works. I decided to go to underground. At first I went to my closest relatives in the village and they were very scared. The story was being broadcast on the television and newspaper, so they feared they might have to bear the burnt of the whole thing. I only spent one night with them, and then I went to Chittagong, the, large, the second largest city in Bangladesh. I started living with my friend when some people got my number through the mobile banking system. I began to receive phone calls from unknown numbers asking where I am. And some person started following me, so I left Chittagong. I kept moving through four different cities. On October 31st, I received news that two different 
militant groups attacked two publication houses at the same time. One publisher were, was killed and three other people were injured. When they were attacked, the publisher's pictures and their views were broadcast in the media. Some old footage of me speaking on behalf of other writers, saying our lives are in danger, was included in the broadcast. Anyone could identify me. I could not go out, not even for food. Some fellow writers, friends helped me with money and shelter, helped me get along. After that, Carnegie Mellon University invited me to Pittsburgh as a visiting scholar, and City of Asylum invited me to join their writing program. Some close friends came with me to the American consulate. Before I left, I could only see my father and one other colleague writer. Since April 2016, I have been living in Pittsburgh as a resident writer at City of Asylum. Greater Pittsburgh Literacy Council has helped me learn American culture and improve my English skill. After coming here, Al-Qaeda killed another writer in my country. Then I decided not to go back to Bangladesh. If I go back my country, I will be killed by a militant group. Now I seek asylum from US immigration to live to be a free human being. Uh, this is my story. I lost my family, friends, countrymen, language, and own culture. Right now I have nothing to lose. After coming in Pittsburgh, I saw there are three rivers. I go to the rivers for solace. A river has a mission to go and make it to the sea. That gives me a message. I want to live a free life. I want to speak truth for our society, community, and for a better world. Uh, now I'm going to uh, sh show some pictures. First picture, like on February 2013, our protest began in Shabak. Bangladesh in favor of uh, in favor of trial for war criminals. So that is a picture of that uh, protest. And then there is an anti-protest were organized by the uh, Islamist pressure group who are demanding the in enactment of a blasphemy law against us. And next picture, after that, uh, government shuts down cr critics. And his name is Shamsud Joha Manik, one of the publisher who was arrested. So the police shut down Manik's book stall at the book fair before arresting him. Uh, since 2013 to 2016, 16 writers were killed by Al Qaeda for defending secularism. So one of them was American Bangladeshi free thinker, Obujit Roy. Uh, in Bangladesh, violence against religious minori uh, minorities increases. Uh, according to the report of human rights organization, 17 people were forcefully disappeared and 162 people were killed by law enforcing agencies in 2017. Uh, we don't want to see this Bangladesh. And uh, now Islam is a, a state religion. And uh, my name was published in their hit list. That is a picture of that. And uh, Pittsburgh is a very uh, welcoming city. And I feel like uh, Pittsburgh, as people of Pittsburgh, is uh, very interested about uh, immigrant and refugee. There's a big community, immigrant and refu uh, refugee. And I was playing on the street. I couldn't uh, believe that. Uh, when I was in Bangladesh, I was always looking at, at uh, my behind. But now I, I got freedom uh, to uh, play. 
not only writing. And this is a picture of uh, City of Asylum. We are, uh, we are holding uh, placards as a part of Freedom of Speech campaign. And I got uh, Behruj Bhutani's name. And he is an Ira Iranian uh, journalist and refugee. Now he lives in Australia. And uh, my friend, local artist, Randy Gilson, was holding uh, Shushmita Banerjee's name. Uh, she was a ba Bengali writer. She was killed in Afghanistan. And uh, our audience at City of Asylum, they are holding uh, Bangladeshi writer's name who are killed. After coming here, I learned uh, and American culture and English at uh, Greater Pittsburgh Literacy Council, uh, English as a second language. And this is my picture there. And after completing workforce development program, I got a job. Uh, right now, I am working at a call center. So, Okay, so I am going, going to uh, read one poem, and okay, it is called uh, Blue Deer, like animal. Blue Deer. Last night in the Milky Way, whose face was adrift in the fragmented moonlight of wisdom, I saw clearly my sadness run around in the form of blue deer. What just happened, I don't know. I walked out in the streets, drowsy and sleepy at midnight. Some people were sitting around a bonfire telling stories of re rebirth. When I cry after releasing the lotus of white despair that was bound tightly in my chest. Invincible people engulf me in memory. From a distance, sometimes I see countless naked souls are sitting in a circle. I laughed and disregarded them. And then a gruesome scene unfolds on the wall in the courtyard. Some ghost come towards me with bony spears. Throwing stones is this punishment for my so-called sins. While returning home, I realized those hallowed souls are my ancestor. From my home, I can still hear them sing about rebirth around the bonfire. My sadness returns like blue deer wandering in a field of immortal stars. Thank you so much. And now we're going to hear from Osama Alamar from Syria. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you, Sitif Asylum. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Amanda. I'm really so happy to be here tonight. I first came to the US on October 2008. The reason why I came here, uh, it was political reason. Uh, the Syrian intelligence were looking at me because one of my stories, actually it was a very short story entitled The Boot. I was talking in this story about uh, how military boot can destroy our life, can destroy our future. But uh, luckily uh, I got my American visa two months before that. Even though I was worried, I was so afraid that they can, they can uh, prevent me to, to come here. So once I get to the airport and uh, hold my boarding pass, I became so happy. And since that day, I'm here, almost 10 years. And uh, anyway, I, I, I couldn't go back uh, since that day because I lost everything there. I lost my apartment. Uh, 
but I always wanted, if we can say, to fool myself and make kind of self-suggestion, I have to be strong. Punishment for weak men is doubled, so life goes on anyway. There's always disasters in our life. There's always victims. So I wanted to be strong because I was looking for the future despite everything. When I first came to the US, I, I came to Chicago. I stayed almost eight years in Chicago. I applied everywhere to, for any job but nobody respond to me. So my cousin offered me to drive a cab. And uh, I fought with him. I thought uh, it's impossible for me. I, uh, this is not me. So he said, you have to be realistic. So after three days from that conversation, from that fighting, I was driving cab number 45, Horizon Company in Chicago. And I can tell you that I became uh, the worst cab driver, not only in the US, but in the whole world. <laughs> Customers asked me to go east, I go south, go north, I go east. It was really, and I, I forgot to get my GPS. In a city like Chicago, it's a giant city, as you know. So I have thousands of stories uh, with my customers, especially drunk customers. But at that time, I, I published my first book in English entitled Full Broad Arabian. Uh, my dear friend C.J. Collins translated uh, into uh, English. He flew from Boston to uh, Chicago uh, to help me translate my work. I first met him in Damascus in 2006. So we started translation in the front seat of my cab. We had no choice. I was uh, working seven days a week, almost 10, 11, sometimes 12 hours a day. It was a uh, really funny, uh, funny time for me and hardship at the same time. It was like black comedy. But necessity is the mother of invention. After that, I applied for City of Asylum, and I was accepted. And now I'm writer in residence at City of Asylum for two years. I've been there for one year, and I have another year until, until May uh, next year. Now I'll read some very, 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 very short stories. The Pride of Garbage. When the owner of the house picked up the bag of garbage and headed out to the street to throw it in the dumpster, the bag was overwhelmed with the fear that she would be put side by side with her companions. But when the man placed her on top of all the others, she became intoxicated with her greatness and look down at them with disdain. Full Blood Arabian. The first, wistfully. If only I were a full blood Arabian horse. The second, disdainfully. Would you wish to be an animal when God in his mercy has created you as a human being who belongs to a great and ancient nation proud of its glorious history? The first, man, don't you know that the value of a full-blood Arabian horse in this world is far greater than the value of a full-blood Arabian human? The pride of the middle finger. I said nothing yet. <laughs> <laughs> the, 
The middle finger couldn't resist the urgings of her own narcissism. I'm better than all of you, she said haughtily to her colleagues, and I stand above you. And how might you be better, O oh venerable one? Asked the other fingers, eyeing her with disapproval. I'm the tallest. She answered in a loud voice, her head held high. Shock cut the tongues of the fingers, but they soon exploded in laughter. Nevertheless, the middle finger continued in a voice louder than before. All of you must bow down in admiration and reverence to my greatness. Hiding their laughter, the other fingers bowed down sarcastically. But the middle finger was greatly surprised to see the people in the street looking at her and laughing. A drop. A drop of dried blood on the ground looked at the setting sun with an expression full of sadness. Why do people look at that giant drop with happiness while they look at me with fear? She asked in a weak voice. We share the same roots. A reply came to her from somewhere unknown. Because you are fixed to the surface of the earth, and she is fixed to the sky. Expired eyes. Climbing up the steps to his home one night after working late, he staggered back and forth from exhaustion, carrying ba paper bags filled with fruits and vegetables. After entering the apartment and putting down the bags, he opened the door to his bedroom and was shocked to see his wife making love with insane ardor to a friend of their sons. She glanced up, him, up and him, deliberately flashing him looks of malicious gloating. He rubbed his eyes hard and opened them to see her humbly performing her prayers. He rubbed his eyes again, this time, this time with furious intensity, and opened them to see her dancing completely naked in the front of the window that faced the house of their young neighbor. He closed his eyes in horror, rubbing them with two hands like tornadoes. When he opened them again, his wife was there, inviting him to share breakfast in bed, her eyes brimming with love and tenderness. He knew then that the allotted time of his eyes had expired. He visited the most famous eye doctor in the country to have two new ones implanted, specially ordered fresh from the factory. And from that day on, he saw his wife exactly as he desired. The stake. I was inspired in this story by the Syrian regime. The great writer was forced to sit on his own pen as punishment for his sharp tongue. The ink shut up into him until his blood turned blue. 
He became one of the elite and slowly came to his senses. The swamp and the stream. The swamp asked the stream with disdain, why are you so skinny? Because I never stop working, the stream answered hurriedly. When I closed the thick blinds on the veranda so that my neighbors couldn't see my four wives and my young daughters, I discovered with a great happiness that this was a perfect way to observe other men's wives and their young daughters. This story is very long. The knife. He was born with a silver knife in his mouth, and he was its first victim. The end. <laughs> How did he sit on his mouth? The third world politely asked the first world to get off his chest so that he could breathe a little better. The first world obligingly got up, but then promptly sat down on his mouth and released a terrible fart. Tongue tie. Before leaving for work, I tied my tongue into a great tie. My colleagues congratulated me on my elegance. They praised me to our boss, who expressed admiration and ordered all employees to follow my example. Free elections. When the slaves re-elected their executioner entirely of their own accord and without any pressure from anyone, I understood that it was still very early to be talking about democracy and human dignity. Thank you. Thank you all. I have a few questions to ask, and any of you who wishes to volunteer an answer, please, please join in. Um, there's a distinction between censoring and censuring, the latter being the expression of criticism or disavowal. Should government officials be free to publicly state such disapproval of artistic or journalistic expression, or does the power of government intrinsically encourage some groups in society political parties, militias, whomever, to threaten those who voice government-criticized ideas? I'll start. Yeah. Uh, I think, like, if we give that power as a, uh, like, and that, then that's going to happen. They, they, when they're arresting and they have a gun, they are uh, searching a book and try to find out uh, what a writer uh, wrote. Like when I, I was, uh, uh, I seek security to the police and uh, they did like, they uh, gave me a paper and I saw, uh, they underlined and they asked me, why did you write it? Okay, so, uh, I, I, I don't think so. Is there any, lim li uh, any limitation about uh, freedom, of freedom of expression? No uh, limitation uh, should be there. That is totally imagination and discover, about discover, discover not new things. And uh, I think 
total human civilization is going uh, forward uh, on depends on uh, imagination and we need to go forward there is no uh, there should be no limitation i think yeah uh, yes I I think there is no in between in great values, freedom of expression, human rights, human dignity, equality between man and woman, between humans in general. There is no in between, to be or not to be. So that's why I published uh, all my books in, in Lebanon. In Lebanon, you can publish your book just like this, because there is no censor censorship. So. There is no in between. It's something like digital, like digital, to be or not to be. Freedom of expression or there is no freedom of expression. There is no in between. Human rights or respect human rights or you don't respect human rights. Yeah, that connects with my, with my second question, so I'll, I'll talk about that now. Uh, American Supreme Court rulings on free speech have waffled between different standards for deciding what speech can be illegal. The clear and present danger standard of the early 20th century held that speech that threatens societal well-being can be outlawed and punished. Ironically, the upshot of this was that speech most likely to be ignored, innocuous speech, could be allowed, but speech finding agreement, speech pretending action, would be more likely to be outlawed. More recently, the imminent lawless action standard holds that only speech that involves planning or inciting crime can be outlawed. I, are either of these standards of any use in nations where it may be a crime to criticize a government or a religion, or perhaps based on your answer, anywhere, including here, would you draw a line in outlawing any speech, hate speech, speech that encourages murder, speech that threatens authors, speech that incites genocide? Yeah, I believe hate is speech, uh, personally I believe that uh, hate is speech exist. Uh, if I, if I uh, threaten to someone to kill, that is, that is not totally, I'm writing that, uh, so that is not a freedom of speech. Or if I threaten to like destroy a, a property of American property, so that is not a like a free speech. So uh, I think there is a line, yes. Uh, and I think there's some standard line like if you uh, say something, uh, we're going to harm physically someone, and if you write that, uh, that is not free, free speech, that is hate speech. If anything you say, and that belongs to uh, racism, uh, though that is not free speech. And, but, uh, like uh, you asked about also, uh, like there, yeah, I think there are a lot of hate crime also going on, we can see, and sometimes, also, the state, they are, the government, they are using that. And I think now we can see that in, in every country, not in, not in Bangladesh. I can see that that's happening uh, everywhere. And like uh, all over the world, like far right wings, they are uh, bringing that in front. And they're trying, trying to bring out uh, from people's minds. Because in, inside our mind, animals are, uh, sleeping and those politicians are trying to bring it out. So like the government and also estate, they also use uh, that. And you asked something about religion. Personally, I consider myself uh, atheist. And in Bangladesh, they killed basically atheist writers. So yeah, so I, I think uh, for religion, uh, we had to we have to welcome any uh, new idea, any criticism, yeah, I think. I, I want to criticize uh, religion, uh, I, I do that also. I, I write a lot of uh, articles in Bengali about that. Uh, even I, I wrote against Hindu, Hindu extremists in my country and also in India, so. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I agree, completely agree with that. And uh, I wanna add, uh, Hate speech, speech is uh, against, against uh, freedom, freedom of expression itself because freedom of expression is related to human rights and to human dignity. They are related to each other. Mm -hmm. So with the f uh, hate speech, it means I'm against uh, human rights, I'm against uh, freedom of ex expression, against 
equality, all these great values. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't make sense. Does artistic expression, including creative writing, deserve any different or more extensive protection than other kinds of speech or press? Uh, I think it depends on the country uh, sometimes. Like in our country, uh, any kind of artistic uh, expression uh, is not uh, welcoming, I think. Yeah, like you, our society is different. And like uh, if anyone play football, cricket, yeah, they're playing, but there are a lot of uh, extremists and Islamists, they're saying, oh, playing is, is against uh, Quran or playing is against uh, Islam. Or like they are against the sculpture. And that, uh, there, are, uh, there are uh, like a uh, few uh, sculptures and uh, our, uh, some people in our country, they want to uh, remove that. And there is a sculpture in front of our Supreme Court and a few months ago there was a big protest by Islamists. They wanted to remove and our government agreed with that and they remove it. And like uh, poetry, but the government is not promoting. We need more uh, promote to uh, bring creative expression. Uh, but uh, the path is very uh, difficult. It's not uh, easy. So we need more, uh, not protection. We need more basically welcome. Just uh, how can we go forward? Yeah. Uh, in Syria in particular, that's why the Syrian revolution failed. Before we get rid of uh, the dictatorship, political dictatorship in Syria, we need to get rid of dictator inside each of us. It, it means we need to free the society before free the, or, or try to get democracy or democratic system. There is two kinds of dictatorship, social dictatorship and political dictatorship. That's what we have in the Middle East. Uh, so at the beginning I was so optimistic at the beginning of the revolution, but then I, I noticed that I was completely wrong. It's not that easy. We need to get rid of dictator inside each of us. And it, uh, this related to uh, all these great values that you uh, ask about. And in reference to, to additional protections about creative expression, I think that uh, the form that those may take are, are difficult to, to necessarily prescribe, but I think that definitely uh, they would be useful as, as creative expression in a lot of ways is one of the only ways that we can effectively change people's minds, how they feel about, about very fundamental and important issues. And we see that in a lot of, uh, in a lot of regimes, performers, artists, writers, they're the people that are targeted first in order to uh, create a, a hegemony of thought and, and philosophy and culture in a given regime. I, I think of an icorn uh, performer that is now in Sweden, I believe, uh, by the name of Abdul, who is from Yemen, who is a, uh, a theater manager. And he, he put on theater workshops for, for young uh, you know, teenage kids in Yemen, and uh, his entire theater organization was uh, seized. His coworkers were arrested. Uh, he was eventually able to flee, but uh, a it lot was of his, burned. yeah, it was burned to the ground um, because they were not only putting on theater that was contrary to what the, the government wanted to put out there, but they were teaching people how to make their own theater, mm -hmm. and that was seen as dangerous. Mm -hmm. 
The WikiLeaks State Department cables seem to confirm what was long expected, that U.S. policymakers support leaders in Muslim and majority nations they themselves consider most corrupt and least democratic in order to keep such countries weak and divided, thereby causing or exacerbating many of the problems of speech and press around the world. U.S. drone attacks averaging upwards of 15 a day probably do a better job of killing those who speak out than those who plan terrorist attacks. What are your thoughts about America's international role in matters of speech and press? Okay. Uh, it's a very good question. So. <laughs> yeah, you are asking about international role. So I want to say first, uh, I see uh, there is a lot of fighting going on against uh, ISIS and Al-Qaeda. So I want to say uh, clearly I am uh, in favor of that, okay? But uh, there are so many things happening, yeah. So when a war happen, happen, there are a lot of things happen. But I never support any kind of uh, genocide. I, I can support a gas attack. I, can, I, can sub, I can't support any kind of like uh, cluster uh, bomb. Those kind of bomb are very uh, destructive. And uh, yeah, nowadays, uh, now we are seeing some, some change, like now uh, uh, American president and uh, North Korea presidents are talking. So we can't uh, believe that a uh, few days ago. So that's happening. And, and uh, there are, uh, I, uh, I can say about my country, uh, America have a great influence on my country. So, why I am here, why I am uh, sitting here, why I am speaking, that is the, my uh, most uh, important part, I think, because I want to say what's happening there, and we need your uh, help for, uh, in so many uh, ways, like I want to say, like, uh, there are so many uh, countries, so they are uh, developing countries, they need more help uh, in so many ways. So. Yeah, if you can help, so why not? Unfortunately, politicians don't yeah. care about, about uh, lives outside the U.S., especially in the Middle East, uh, unfortunately. But uh, there's no emotions in uh, politics. There's no emotions. In Syria now, there's victims every day. Civilians, women, children, old men, Every day, every day. Nobody cares about them, unfortunately. And to build on that, uh, the, what we try to do at City of Asylum is to see that our, our government is in many ways uh, neglecting parts of uh, an international role that we see the U.S. needs to, needs to inhabit, namely uh, providing a place that is a, a, a beacon of free speech and hope that people can come to and be safe in. And uh, whether the government does that or not, uh, we can't do much about that, but what we can do is be a place and a city and uh, an organization that can welcome people here, that can welcome writers like Osama and Tuin, that can welcome uh, voices of, of many different kinds uh, to freely speak their mind and, and uh, you know, sort of build it and they will come mentality. Mm -hmm. I think we still have enough time for a few questions from the audience. I believe there's a microphone out there somewhere or will be shortly. So if any of you have questions. This is kind of a question about um, being an individual in your country because most people in a dangerous environment would conform. So I'm just wondering, um, what were you thinking when you were continuing to write and challenge? What were your motivating thoughts or what were you holding on to um, that helped you continue your work? Because I mean, your lives are at stake. So I'm just wondering, um, what did you hold on to or what helped you continue your work? 
Okay, uh, after coming here, uh, I came here by myself. I, I left my family. Yeah, in my country, there is uh, my whole family. I came, came here by myself. Uh, that is a great loss, you know, but uh, after coming here, I got, uh, a, I feel privileged, like more than 15 writers uh, left Bangladesh, but they didn't get uh, two years program like that. It, it, it is like a dream job for me. And uh, after coming here, yeah, I feel, uh, I miss my country. Uh, I feel sad for my uh, family, but I do, not, I do not need to look at my back. Uh, anyone is following me or not. Like last six months before uh, leaving my country, I had to always look at back my uh, back. And that means I feel uh, freedom. And I feel, uh, and uh, last I finished a novel about my country. Uh, I couldn't, couldn't uh, think about that. I, I, will, I am going to write that novel. So yes, I, I am feeling safe. That's mo mo uh, most important, basically, personally. And also, I feel I have a, a space. Uh, people are uh, interested to hear. And uh, I am focused on my country, basically. There are so many things going on in the uh, world I can't write about every issue, so I am very focused on my and in Bangladesh about Bangladesh, and uh, I am very uh, glad to see now uh, young generation in in uh, Bangladesh. They are very uh, creative and they are uh, doing protest on the streets. So I try to spread all of my idea to them and. Uh, the main part is I feel safe. That is the important, yeah. Uh, I can tell you when I, when I uh, immigrated to the US, I felt as if I moved to another planet. It was completely new life to me. And I stopped uh, writing for almost one year. I couldn't write anything. I felt as if I became someone else. Uh, I. I felt as if uh, I lost my soul as a writer. I became someone else. That was my feeling. Especially when I started driving cab. <laughs> so it was like shock with me, uh, for me. It was like selective service. V very bad selective service. <laughs> but step by step, I, I forced myself to 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 go back to myself to my my real soul. Uh, I went back to my writing and readings. It was uh, it was really hardship. It it took me a long time. It took me a long time. And uh, at that time, I I thought I, I wanted to go back to Syria despite everything. I left Syria because of political reasons, but despite that, because I was so depressed, I didn't know what to do. Even go to another country, to Europe or wherever. So, but I, I, I fooled myself and uh, I said to myself, I have to be strong. I was looking for the future. Life is not easy at all. I always say to Tuhin, life is not easy mm -hmm. at all. And he always repeated to me too. So. <laughs> but we, we, we need to be strong. So in the interest yeah. of supporting any kind of diversity like countercultures of any society or religious this way and that way, uh, how we need to think how to defend the rights of minorities without infringing on others' rights. And in our country, it's based on a constitution where everybody wants rights for themselves, but they're not thinking about rights of people who are different from them as much as should be, I think. And uh, so you have to think of religious liberty and not forcing their specific doctrine on everybody. You know, well, so there's religious liberty and the liberty to not 
follow a mainstream of any religion or culture. So uh, that's about what I have to say. Um, Osama, you mentioned some of your inspirations about some of your other your stories. Do you have any other inspirations? Inspirations? Uh, in inspiration. Inspiration. Oh, there's insp inspiration everywhere. There's inspiration everywhere in, in among humans, nature. I always say that human nature, uh, animals, objects, everywhere. So we, as a writers or artists, we just need to catch catch the idea and work on it. I, for me, I can make a story from these chairs. So, conversation between chairs. Yeah, I want to say, like, I want to add, like, after finishing this uh, event, that those chairs will be empty. So, that is, a, like, a story, you know? We can make story of yeah, it. Yeah, so. so. I think we have time for one more question, if there is one. I'm just curious, you were writers in your own country and you're writers now that you're here. How, if in any way, has your writing changed by writing in here? What, is your writing different or are you still writing from the same impulses but just feeling freer to do it? Okay. Um, now I'm working on a novel about the Syrian war. It's, uh, it's very hard to see your country destroyed from afar and you can do nothing. You only watch, watch the events. Uh, it breaks any heart, I think. So yes, I'm here now in the US, very far, very far away from Syria. But because of this crazy events, because of this Syrian disaster, Syrian hell, my heart is there now. To be honest with you, my heart is there, and now I'm working every day about uh, this novel, about this uh, big disaster. And as you know, there's Syrian refugees everywhere now, maybe even in outer space. So it look it looks like a very big explosion, just like a volcano eruption, very very big volcano eruption, so I cannot avoid that. It's, uh, it's in my heart and my soul and my mind. Uh, and, uh, so I'm, I'm writing about Syria now. Uh, I think uh, for, for me, uh, I see a lot of changes uh, in my writing, uh, positive and negative both. Uh, like uh, little by little I am uh, forgetting my language, I sometimes miss, I, I can't uh, remember my uh, Bengali word, what I need, I, I feel that, some, I am forgetting that. And also, uh, I published seven poetry books, so I, I don't know why, uh, now, now I am writing less poetry, yeah. And basically I'm missing my uh, country and nat nature and all of the, those uh, things. But another way, you know, every language have uh, beautiful things, beautiful words. So like Bengali, I think uh, we have only 50% Bengali word and rest of 50% words comes from different languages, like from Arabic, from English. Chair, we call chair. Not, we don't say anything. So, and those beautiful things are uh, important for me. I want to write, I want to touch those beautiful things. I want to uh, keep in mind those beautiful feelings. So, yeah, I am trying to right now uh, write some poems. How can I use some elements uh, like tree or street name? I am using that. Uh, I wrote like 50 exile poems. And I got my all translation. That book is going to publish this year by City of Asylum. It would be my first book. And in this book, uh, I 
try to use uh, so many uh, things. I try to portray my environment. Now I am uh, here in Pittsburgh. So yeah, I, I can see a lot of good change. And like after coming here, now I can see Bangladesh from uh, very far away. And uh, it, 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 it give, gives me, give me like uh, more, uh, like not emotional, I can think more uh, very con constructively like, and yeah, and I, I got a chance, I got a good, uh, a big, I think big stage to go forward uh, with my writing. Yeah, that's very important also. All right, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank everybody for coming and most especially to thank our distinguished uh, three guests this evening for their good work and remarkable art. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hartford. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Long, for moderating tonight. Our writers will be in the lobby. They do have some uh, books that you can get, and also they'll be out there for a signing. I want to thank you, Dr. Rahman, for your terrific opening remarks to set the tone this evening, and the World Affairs Council as well. We will see you in the lobby and enjoy your evening, and thank you all for coming here and having such an engaging conversation about our freedoms of expression, something that is so dear and necessary to our country that allows our friends to be here and, and continue your expression. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Elamar and Mr. Dash and Mr. Duran on our stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.